This talk that I'm about to give was going to be about good health and what good health is. And uh, the more observant of you looking at this picture here will have figured out the problem already for this chap with metabolic syndrome. So that wee soft drink bottle sitting there would possibly be a problem. So when I was talking about good health, I thought, well, what is good health? It's the absence of bad stuff. It means you're not overweight. You don't have high blood pressure. You don't have high levels of triglycerides in your blood. The level of HDL, the good protective LDL, is high, or it ought to be high. And uh, you don't have elevated blood sugar levels. So in essence, this is good health is the absence of what we call metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome to a doctor has five features. If you have three of those five, I will diagnose you with metabolic syndrome. That includes if you have weight around your abdomen, if your fasting glucose is over 5.6, if your blood pressure is over 135 and 85, if your triglycerides are over 1.5, if your HDL is less than one, if you tick three of those boxes, you have metabolic syndrome. Now, the interesting thing is that each one of those problems is caused by resistance to insulin. Everyone. And you'll notice that LDL doesn't form part of that definition. It's because we know just looking at LDL level per se is not that good. So we're going to take a bit of a tour and have a look at each of those five features and have a look at how insulin parlays into those. This is a DEXA scan of one of my patients. And what you can note is that there's this yellow here. This is fat. This is a pattern of abdominal obesity. This is the bad stuff. This is the stuff that's associated with risk of heart disease. And we also know very clearly that as your level of insulin goes up, there's a strong correlation with increased body weight. So insulin is implicated in obesity. So how does it actually cause obesity? So we know that it does make the fat cells bigger, but let's have another look at that mechanism how. So this is a slide that you've seen already today, but we'll just, for the sake of completeness, run through it again. So if you want to make that fat cell bigger, you have to stuff more in. And the things that you want to put in, if, we, if that was the goal, would be a triglyceride here and glucose. Because when the glucose and fatty acids from the triglycerides are inside the cell, they combine to form the storage form of fat, which is called a triglyceride. Now, this triglyceride molecule is too big to diffuse across the cell membrane. It's not going anywhere. So for it to be made small enough so that the fatty acids can cross over this membrane here, we need to cleave it. And that's where something called lipoprotein lipase comes into its own. And it's no coincidence that you give a little bit of insulin and the activity of this enzyme here increases substantially. Insulin also acts on this transporter here, what we call the GLUT4 transporter. This is like a gate that glucose uses to get into the fat cell. If you have an increase in your insulin level, it opens the gate. Glucose goes in. And the end result is that you've now stored fat and the fat cell is bigger. Now, to add insult to injury, if you want to burn the fat, you have to repeat this process in reverse where you first break this complex molecule down. And you do that using something called hormone-sensitive lipase. What does insulin do to the action of this? Wipes it out. So there's a triple effect there. If you have elevated insulin levels, very, very clear that that elevated insulin leads to increased fat size. So let's have a look at number two. Elevated blood pressure. It's been clearly shown that elevated insulin levels correlate with increases in blood pressure. So on this graph you can see here on the top line, this is what happens if you give people insulin. On the bottom line, that's what happens if you don't. So what you can see is a, a clear causative mechanism of insulin in increasing their blood pressure. And this is something which we see every week in clinic. Once people start the low-carb diet, their insulin levels fall, what happens? we have to reduce their blood pressure medications that they're invariably on, otherwise they feel dizzy. It will overshoot. So you control insulin levels, you can 
absolutely can control blood pressure. Now, this is the most well-known mechanism that uh, insulin resistance can cause a change in blood pressure. Essentially, if you end up with a fatty liver, you damage your liver, you increase the amount of uric acid that's produced, and that uric acid inhibits the action of something called nitric oxide. And the job of nitric oxide is to cause the blood vessels to relax. That reduces your blood pressure. Now, while this is the most well-known mechanism, it's not the most important one. To understand the major cause of hypertension, we have to understand a key concept, and that's that fluid follows salt, wherever it is in the body. If you increase the amount of salt you have in the blood, that will draw fluid to it. We've all probably come across this in chemistry classes in school. Now, insulin does a magnificent job at telling the kidneys to hold on to salt. So having a look here, this is a, a, an example of the structure of the kidney. So this is where the blood um, come, passes through here, in and out here, and some of the fluid from the blood gets what we call filtered here. And that fluid passes through this tubule all the way down here until eventually it passes out into the urine. And what you can see here is that at these four sites here, insulin draws salt back out of that potential urine and pushes it back into the blood. So in a state of excess insulin, our bodies are doing everything they can to hold on to salt. Now, this explains a couple of things. So first of all, essential hypertension, that type of high blood pressure that your doctor said, we don't know why you get it, you just get it. If you speak to the smart doctors, they're renal doctors, they're the ones who understand this stuff. They will tell you that high blood pressure, essential hypertension, is an insulin-dependent state. What does that mean? You don't have high insulin levels, you're probably not going to have high blood pressure. And this also explains something else. Ever heard of the keto flu? Back in the 70s, it used to be called the Atkins flu. They didn't really know what was going on back then, but we do now. So we understand it's due to salt balance, but it's... This is the mechanism why. If you suddenly go on a low-carbohydrate diet, your body will not hold on to that salt that it once was because your insulin levels have dropped. So you'll end up with a temporary period of salt deficiency until your body can readapt to that. Remember, fluid follows salt. You lower the salt level in your blood, you lower your blood volume. You lower your blood pressure, you're probably going to feel dizzy. And we know that, amongst other things, that dizziness is one of the key features of what we see in the keto flu. Now, as an aside, um, there's a lot of concern about salt, and I'd just like to present this paper here. So, big paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, over 100,000 participants, followed them up for almost four years, and they measured how much salt was coming out in the urine versus your chance of dying, something we call all-cause mortality. So this is the graph. So what we can see here is uh, running up the side here, this is your chance of dying from any cause. And on the bottom here, this is how much salt you are excreting in your urine. So we can assume that your salt intake must have been at least that much. And what we see here is that the lowest level of mortality was somewhere between four and six grams of salt a day. If you had less salt than that, look what happens to your risk of all-cause mortality. If you've got two grams of salt a day, that's about double the risk of dying from any cause. So uh, when we're talking about salt, it's critically important, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet, because you have to understand ketogenic diet means low levels of insulin. Your body's not holding onto that salt. So a lot of people will actually find that to avoid the symptoms of keto flu, they actually need to increase their salt intake into the diet. Now, uh, let's move on to another of these features of the metabolic syndrome, triglycerides. Now, clearly, all the epidemiological data out there says if you have a high level of triglycerides in your blood, your risk of heart disease is increased. And uh, this graph here demonstrates their association with diabetes and, by proxy, insulin levels. If you have high levels of insulin, as seen in diabetes, you have high levels of triglycerides. Now, to understand why you have high levels of triglycerides, we first of all have to understand that the liver can store glucose as glycogen, but only up to a point, 100 grams. 
after you flood the liver with sugar and it reaches its capacity, it has nowhere to go, it can't be stored. So instead what happens is it starts this process called de novo <coughs> lipogenesis. De novo lipogenesis means you'll produce fat, you'll produce triglycerides. And this is a very elegant study where they said, we're going to give people more carbohydrate than they can burn, and we'll see what happens. So on day two here, you'll see that they burnt that much of the carbohydrate, and they, test, they measured that through some fancy techniques, and they turned this much carbohydrate into glycogen stores. Now, what happened on the next day? Because their stores were quite full. They probably burnt a little bit of glycogen, but there wasn't that much room. So they burnt a bit. They burnt a bit more, actually. They stored a bit of glycogen, but then they started to produce fat. And as the days went on, and you can imagine that this is happening every day to people on the standard Australian diet. They're giving their bodies more carbohydrates than they need. And this process, lipogenesis, making triglycerides, is occurring. You put in more carbs than you can, and because you have insulin resistance at other tissues, the sugar can't be taken up that effectively in the, in the muscle anymore. It has to go somewhere. Part of it goes here, and it forms fat. So if we have a look here, this is the liver. We make this fat de novo lipogenesis. So what happens? Then it gets exported. Remember these VLDL particles from the last lecture? They're holding triglycerides. Enters the circulation. Bang. You now have increased triglycerides in your circulation. Now, having a look at HDL, this relates to triglycerides. We know HDL is good. If you have high levels of HDL, it is a very good indicator that your risk of heart disease is reduced. Now, the problem is that we can see the triglycerides can be taken up by the HDL <coughs> molecules. And through various pathways, if the HDL molecules take up too much triglyceride, it ends up leading to their breakdown, their catabolism, hence a reduction in HDL. So the same mechanism that causes an increase in triglycerides also eventually leads to a reduction in your HDL level. So finally, we come to step five of the metabolic syndrome, elevated blood sugar level. Now, again, this is clearly related to insulin resistance. So what we're seeing here is a graph across the lifespan, a theoretical, demonstrating how insulin is becoming more and more resistant. What this means is it doesn't work as well as it used to work. So the compensatory response of the body is to release more insulin for the same effect. And if we have a look at what happens as the insulin resistance is occurring, this line here is fasting plasma glucose. We can see that fasting plasma glucose increases. Now, to appreciate how this resistance causes, uh, you have to understand that the insulin is what actually draws the sugar out of the circulation. And in a normal situation where insulin's working, it does this quite nicely. It goes into the liver, plunk a bit into the muscle, take a little bit into the fat, sure, and you're not left with an excess amount of sugar in the bloodstream. But if insulin stops working as effectively, you still take a bit of sugar up, but not as much. What you're left with is a large amount of sugar still residing within the blood vessels. So I thought I'd now go back, this is the features of metabolic syndrome, and clearly they're all caused by insulin resistance. So let's have a look at some uh, modern research done about 33 years ago, uh, because we've got a really good practice in medicine of ignoring good studies and good science. This study took 10 diabetic Aborigines who all met the criteria for metabolic syndrome. They lived in urban areas, and they were recruited for a seven-week trial where they went to live a traditional lifestyle, eating a traditional diet, and this was conducted in the Pantajan community about an hour's light plane flight north of Derby. So what happened? So short answer, things got better. This is a graph here showing their blood glucose level. Their fasting blood glucose level on average at the start of the trial was 11.6 after seven weeks, just seven weeks, it went down to 6.6. .6. Their triglyceride level at the start was 4.02, and after seven weeks, it went down to 1.15. Huge reductions. What about their body weight? 
we saw a large reduction in their body weight. A mean reduction in their BMI went from 27.2 down to 24.5. So you're probably wondering, what is it in this traditional diet that led to these very impressive results? Well, I did a bit of research. And when I actually looked into the literature a bit deeper, it appears that the indigenous population has always valued fat in the diet. This here is a witchetty grub. 67% fat and considered a delicacy. So when I looked at the data from this study and I plotted it and I compared it to the NHMRC recommended diet, so this is a diet here that fits within their recommended macronutrient intake, I compared it to a typical high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, which I use for my patients. And I think you can see that the diet used in this study is far, far closer to a low-carbohydrate diet. It's almost opposite of the diet that's uh, suitable and recommended by the NHMRC. So uh, I just want to try and present a view of the totality of evidence here. So I'm going to present a series of meta-analyses. Now, the way these studies work is that each line here represents an entire study. And the results are, uh, it's called a forest plot. And the results are shown here on the end. And this uh, point here represents the average results. And the length of this line represents an error bar. So this large dot down here represents an average of all the results. So when we have a look at low-carb diets and weight loss across the board, the science says they help you lose weight. We apply this same methodology to looking at triglycerides. Again, down the bottom, they help you lose weight. They help you lose tri uh, lower your triglycerides. Your HDL, well, look at this. Big increase in the good HDL. What happens to blood pressure? Well, blood pressure goes down, and we know exactly why. It's that salt effect in the kidneys. And finally, we get a reduction in the blood glucose level as well, as we can see from this point down here. So we're now just going to take a little bit of a detour and have a look at what causes this insulin resistance. Clearly, it's not good. Clearly, it's doing us a lot of harm. So. Uh, I'm going to also take you through a bit of a journey on some of the patient results that we've seen in the clinic over the last few years. So the first point here is that visceral fat, fat in the liver, leads to insulin resistance. And we've now started to figure out the pathways how. This is retinol binding protein 4. You don't need to know the name. But you do need to know that it correlates very well with body mass index, correlates very well with insulin index, and it's been implicated as a causal mechanism of insulin resistance. It's produced by fatty livers. So here's what happens. Uh, and this is grossly simplified, but uh, we might present the science at a, uh, a conference in the future. You have a high carbohydrate diet. And in particular, fructose is implicated here, as most of you will know. And that leads to fat accumulation, the visceral fat and around the liver. That then directly leads to an increase in this retinol binding protein 4, and through various mechanisms, this is the molecule which actually contributes to insulin resistance. Now, I think you can see the problem here, because we know that insulin resistance leads to fat accumulation. This is a rast and rather nasty cycle here, and the only way to deal with it is to eliminate carbohydrates from the diet. So I was always impressed in the clinic when I'd have people come in and they'd be morbidly over obese. They would sometimes be 130, 140, 150, 160 kilograms. And they'd lose maybe 10% of their body weight. They'd still be grossly overweight, but their blood tests looked very, very good. They looked so much better than they were before. And this is why. This is a DEXA scan of that same patient you saw earlier. You can see the fat around the viscera here. A repeat scan six months later, after only about 9% weight loss, and we can see the visceral fat has all but dissolved. So the fat that you lose first on a ketogenic diet is the bad stuff. This is magnificent. So a very modest degree of weight loss 
is going to be beneficial for your health. Now, if we actually have a look at this in another way, I can assess liver health through blood tests, which I do in my clinic. So what you need to understand about liver cells is that they've got chemicals and constituents inside them that aren't really found anywhere else in the body in high levels. And if you damage that liver cell, it will release the contents into the circulation where we can detect it with a blood test. And if we see certain chemicals that we know are particular to liver cells in the circulation, that infers that there's a degree of damage happening to the liver. So what we're having a look at here, I want you to have a look at this bottom one on the line. All the doctors in the audience know that ALT relates to liver health. Look what happens before a low-carb diet and after a low-carb diet. The liver gets healthier. Now, this is probably one of the most important tests I do in the clinic. We call it the glucose tolerance insulin response test. What happens is that you have a blood test and following that you have a drink. At half an hour, not shown here, one hour and two hours, we then repeat blood tests. But rather than testing only glucose, which is the standard test done, we also measure your insulin level. And this is really, really important because the pattern of insulin, the height of insulin, is very predictive of your future health outcomes. This was a really nice study published several years ago, and the main finding from this study was that the peak insulin, depending on whether it occurred at 30, 60 or 90 minutes, was very predictive of your chance of developing diabetes over the next 11 years. So in this first group, you can see your chance of becoming diabetic over 10 years, not so bad. What happens if you're a pattern four? Almost a one in two chance of developing diabetes. Understanding your insulin profile is essential to understanding your health. So let's have a look at real world patients. These are actual patient results. So we can see here, looking at the insulin, we have a peak of insulin occurring at the one hour mark. So we'll just ignore the glucose for a moment. So what pattern of insulin? Is that? That's a pattern three. Percent chance of progressing to diabetes over the next 11 years? 15%. What about this individual? Their insulin levels are not as high. Doesn't look as bad, right? But it's the duration and the timing of the peak which is also essential. We can see here, it's constantly going up. There's no peak in the first two hours. Chance of progression to diabetes in the next 10 years or so? About one in two. Now, we can also uh, get some other interesting insights from this type of testing in our patients. So this patient came to me and they were caught in a pattern of cyclical eating. So those of you who are now ketogenic, think back to when you used to eat carbs. Come morning tea time, you would hunt down a small child if you needed to to get some food. <laughs> so why is that? So something I see not infrequently in my patients is something called reactive hypoglycemia. So you'd think that if you stuffed 75 grams of glucose into the circulation, that your sugar should be high and should stay high. But not in everybody. In this individual, you can see they overshot. They released insulin, and that insulin overcorrected the sugar that was put in, so at the two hour mark, they are left with a blood glucose level of 1.1. <coughs> in this situation, you're gonna feel lousy. All the doctors in the audience are probably wondering what happened to this patient. They're fine, they did not die. <laughs> but at this point in time, this patient was going to crave carbohydrates. Now you've seen bowl and a half of crunchy nut cornflakes, couple of up and goes, is the same as this blood test. If you start off your day with that healthy breakfast, for this individual, that means they'll be caught on a cycle of reactive eating, trying to restore their blood glucose levels back to normal. So in this situation, this is a revelation for this patient. You stop putting that rubbish in at the start of the day, your blood sugar levels stabilise. And that's exactly what happened. Now, uh, one other point is that because we do the uh, testing, so depending on who you are, we'll do the half an hour testing as well as the one hour testing, but something we see not infrequently is an elevated one hour test or a half an hour blood sugar with a normal two hour test. Now, a blood sugar of over 
at any time during this test is consistent with the diagnosis of diabetes. So I suspect there's a lot of stuff, even if we were only measuring glucose, if we included the one hour marker into the standard test, it would be a whole lot more diagnostic. So we've talked about the uh, insulin resistance that tends to develop over a long period of time. And uh, so what essentially happens, this was very well covered by Duron, is that over time, our insulin gradually rises to compensate for the resistance. But there reaches a point where it can't compensate any longer. And then your blood sugar starts to rise. And then several years after that, your insulin secretion reaches a peak. Now, this is what is in common parlance known as pancreatic burnout. Now, I'm going to tell you what causes this. So you've all seen before in my previous lecture what happens when sugar attaches to proteins, glycates them. It leads to the formation of something called advanced glycosylated end products. It leads to cross-linking of proteins and basically defunctions it. Well, this very process has been shown to happen in the cells of the pancreas that make insulin. Now, I don't know if you think that's ironic or not, but the sugar which the insulin is trying to control will actually kill the cells that release the insulin. Now, one of the exciting things that we see, though, is that this process, if you don't get to it too late, is partially reversible. And I can actually test um, people's ability to secrete insulin. I measure something called C-peptide, and what we're seeing is that we haven't been doing it for very long, but the data looks relatively promising at the moment that we're starting to see a restoration of people's ability to secrete more insulin over time. It's taking several months, but it looks quite exciting at the moment. So let's think about this chart of insulin resistance and compare it to patients we've actually seen in the clinic. So these are actually patients which I've seen. So here we see we're right down the left-hand side, healthy days, blood sugar's low, insulin's low, 10. What happens now? Blood sugar's low, but you can see that insulin has now come up to 83. This is not diagnostic of anything. This individual would go and have standard testing and be told they have nothing to worry about. It's at this point that they might be told they have prediabetes because their blood sugar here has started to come up off the baseline. But you can see here that insulin's even higher. And the final stage is now. Blood sugar is 11.4, that's diagnostic of diabetes at two hours. This patient would be told that they have diabetes. But have a look at the insulin. The insulin's actually not that high. This is demonstrating how the capacity of the pancreas to secrete insulin actually gets damaged when it's exposed to sustained elevated blood sugar levels and your insulin level will then drop. So here's the good news. We can fix this. And you can fix it in a relatively short period of time. This patient, over about three months, have a look at the one hour level of insulin there. Big drop. This patient, again, some quite reasonable drops, even more weight loss. This patient, again, some very impressive drops. So we can actually reverse this insulin resistance. We can test it. We can prove it. Thank you.